Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm Cal Rastiala. I direct the Burkle Center for International Relations here at UCLA. Uh, and I am very happy to have with us tonight uh, General John Allen. I think as you know, our mission at the Burkle Center is to help us all understand the world a little bit better. And one of the ways that we do that, I think one of the most important ways, is to bring some of the most significant and interesting thinkers and policymakers here to campus to speak with us and debate with us the most pressing issues of the day. And for three decades, the Bernard Brody Lecture has been a critical part of that mission. So the Bernard Brody Distinguished Lecture on the Conditions of Peace is named after the late Professor Bernard Brody, a UCLA uh, professor, who uh, was one of the nation's leading Cold War strategists. Over the last three decades, we've had uh, an incredible group of people give this lecture. Presidents, prime ministers, secretaries of state and defense, national security advisors, Nobel Prize winners, US senators. Last year, we had a terrific lecture with ambassador, former ambassador to Russia, Mike McFall. Um, and as mentioned this year, we're going to have a terrific one as well. So it's a great honor to welcome to UCLA General John Allen. General John Allen is currently co-director of the Brookings Center for the 21st Century for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. He retired in 2013 at the conclusion of a 38-year Marine Corps career. Immediately following retirement, he served as senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense on Middle East security, and in this role assisted uh, the Secretary of State with the Middle East peace process by leading a security dialogue with Israeli officials and the Palestinian Authority. Seeing that, and General Allen has had uh, really an incredible uh, perch from which to look at that particular conflict. From August 2014 to November 2015, he served as President Obama's special envoy, envoy to the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL. In this capacity, he organized the 65-member Global Coalition against the Islamic State, advised the President on the implementation of that strategy, and led negotiations with Turkey uh, and other uh, nations in the region. As an active duty officer, General Allen commanded Afghan and U.S. forces in Afghanistan from 2011 to 2013. During his career in the Marines, he also served in a variety of command and staff positions, including operations in the Balkans, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. General Allen graduated with military honors from the Naval Academy. He holds master's degrees in national security studies and intelligence from Georgetown, the Defense Intelligence College, and the Naval War College. Over his distinguished career, he has received countless awards, both military and from foreign governments, and he is the recipient of the Department of State's Distinguished Honor Award. Please join me in welcoming to UCLA General John Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor uh, to be with you this evening, and Cal, thanks for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, I'll just keep my remarks short because I think it's important that we move to the Q&A and, and then bring the audience into the conversation as quickly as we can. I've been in and out of the Middle East for the better part of the last 25 years. And in that period of time, I have not seen uh, instability as it has emerged uh, before. Uh, the problems in the region are longstanding problems, uh, institutional weakness, corruption, and incapacity to embrace the populations, the growing youth bulge, and there are many, many difficulties and many problems. Uh, they were full, fully in evidence in the spring of 2011 uh, with the Arab Spring, as we saw one state after another uh, racked with civil disturbance and ultimately the collapse uh, of multiple states, most of them post-revolutionary sectarian states, and where most of those went down, many of the monarchies were able to continue to sustain themselves. But it created an enormous instability across the region, and we watched this from my headquarters of the Central Command at Tampa, seeing how we could shore up our partners and to try to maintain as much stability as we could. One of the principal uh, instability, regions of instability, uh, that emerged was the Syrian Civil War. Uh, it was accompanied, of course, by the collapse in Libya, the collapse in Tunisia, uh, two shifts of leadership uh, in Egypt and the collapse uh, of Yemen. And we could argue as well, potentially, and nearly the collapse of, uh, of Iraq as well. But out of the Syrian civil war, we began to see the emergence uh, of real extremism 
uh, in the form of Jabhat al-Nusra, which would eventually, as an al-Qaeda organization, split into two organizations, the al-Qaeda organization and something that we had just begun to see emerging in that civil war, the so-called Islamic State. The Islamic State immediately went on the march. It had been expelled from the al-Qaeda organization because of the, the horror and how horrific it had been with respect to how it treated both prisoners and the populations that it ultimately would subjugate. And in the latter part of 2013, we began to see the organization on the move in uh, Iraq, in particular in the Euphrates River Valley, where ultimately it would seize a place where I spent the better part of a year, a town called Fallujah, and eventually establish itself within 60 miles of Baghdad. Uh, in the late spring and the early summer of 2014, we saw this organization in the full bloom of its military capacity cross the border from northeast Syria into northwest Iraq. And frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I had witnessed atrocities uh, I thought were unparalleled uh, in history. Uh, what we saw Al-Qaeda, or what we saw ISIL do uh, to those that they captured and the populations which they would ultimately subjugate uh, were beyond the human pale. Very quickly, four Iraqi army divisions collapsed. Mosul was taken. Uh, ISIL was intent on exterminating the Yazidi population and to turn to the east to, to capture the capital of the Kurdistan regional government, Erbil. The United States reacted uh, ultimately to the extermination of the Yazidis and to the attack on Erbil uh, by calling for an international coalition and immediately beginning to bomb the organization to try to slow down its momentum. Daesh, as we called it in Arabic, which is typically the term I have used, Daesh continued in its march down the Tigris River with large-scale uh, Iraqi army formations fleeing before it uh, with the intent ultimately of bypassing Baghdad and heading to the west and into Najaf and Karbala to destroy the Shia holy places. We fully expected the invasion of Iran to try to, to uh, prevent this <clears throat> and the full-blown war between Iran and Iraq and Daesh uh, had we not intervened. The president called me and specifically asked me to help to build a coalition. It was uh, reminiscent of the coalition which I led in Iraq, or excuse me, in Afghanistan for two years. We were to able to cobble together a 60-nation coalition, which numbers 66 today, with two international organizations, the Arab League and the European Union, which have been of enormous assistance to us, both international organizations. The coalition pursues a five-line strategy, and we can talk about those in the questions and answers. We don't have the time tonight for me to go through any one of them. It would be several hours, actually. But a military strategy, a strategy to attack ISIL's finances, a strategy to stem the flow of foreign fighters, a strategy to counter the narrative and the message of Daesh with a counter message, and ultimately a strategy to stabilize the populations that have been liberated from ISIL. That process has been underway now for about 18 months. Uh, we have made progress on the ground with respect to uh, diminishing the coverage of ISIL uh, in Iraq and in Syria. We've made progress in shrinking uh, the financial cap capabilities of this organization, which is un unusual and unique uh, as a terrorist organization, uh, in that it's nearly completely financially self-sufficient. That's something we've never seen before. But it's also a vulnerability, and we've been exploiting that vulnerability. We've had difficulties, obviously, dealing with foreign fighters, and that difficulty has been compounded by the incredible advantage that Daesh has put social media to use, both in terms of recruiting and command and control. Uh, but we've made progress there as well. In particular, we've made progress in the stabilization of populations that have been liberated. And key to this is if we can create the conditions for individuals to return to their homes, uh, once the area has been liberated from Daesh or ISIL, we can keep them from going to Europe. And the challenge and the twofold challenge that has emerged in the aftermath of, of our efforts now as a coalition to try to deal with this organization is that the refugee calamity a direct result of the Syrian civil war uh, poses a direct and strategic threat uh, to the fabric of society as we know it uh, in Europe today. And second, Daesh has changed. It has changed as an organization from when we init initially organized the coalition. When we initially organized the coalition, it was primarily confined regionally to Iraq and to Syria. In the period of time since it declared itself I think quite wisely declared itself for the purposes of its own preservation and its attractiveness as a caliphate, 
and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi as Khalif Ibrahim, the, the Caliph of the Caliphate. It has garnered the support of multiple organizations around the world, which Daesh calls distant provinces, and there are about eight of them. Uh, they are both uh, additional capacity for this organization, but they also make it much more uh, difficult and much more challenging locally or regionally to achieve the peace and stability that we seek. And I think many of you are familiar with some of these organizations. Uh, Ansar al-Sharia in, uh, in Libya, Boko Haram in West Africa, Ansar Bet al-Maktis in uh, the Sinai. Uh, a distant province has emerged in the Caucasus in Russia, one that is a swath of the ancient uh, Muslim society uh, across uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan called the Khorasan. One is emerging in Bangladesh and one is emerging in Southeast Asia. This has uh, created a substantial reach for this organization. It did not enjoy when this contingency began in 2014. So Daesh really exists in three components today, and I'll conclude my remarks by saying these three components, which is what we call core ISIL in Iraq and Syria, and the constellation of distant provinces, most of which I've just named for you, are tied together with a growing network of capabilities that operationalize the concept of the global caliphate. And this is the challenge that we face today. And it is within that network that we see Daesh exercising command and control, moving of fighters, money, weapons, and capabilities, and unifying a narrative. Uh, it is because of that narrative that we have seen attacks in places like Paris twice. I was in Paris in the first attack last year. In Belgium, of course, tragically, most recently, in, in Copenhagen. Uh, in Belgium previously, the attack, tragic attack on the Jewish Center, in Sydney, in Australia, and in Ottawa. Uh, this network is one of the greatest challenges that we now face. And sensing the network, in mapping that network, and moving as a community of nations into a relentless attack of the critical nodes and critical pathways of that network can eliminate the connection between the core and the constellation of provinces permit us to deal with the provinces individually. So we have a challenge ahead of us, ladies and gentlemen. The challenge isn't just Daesh. The challenge is extremism, unrequited extremism that, that flows ultimately from a radicalization of large segments of the population of this region that have no hope. It's an issue of governance. It's an issue, issue of justice. It's an issue of human rights, the rights of women. It's an issue of uh, the profound in, inequity in economic opportunities, and until we're able to take long-term steps, ultimately, to strengthen the institutions of government in the Arab states and in the region, we're going to continue to see the kind of radicalization that can push us, push large segments of the population into extremist arms. Fighting forever cannot be the option here. We have got to take the steps necessary to change the fundamental underlying social conditions that generate the radicalization and organizations like Al-Qaeda and Daesh. And until we're able to, until we can take the long view to do that, I'm afraid we're condemned to the struggle that we have today. We're committed to this and we're going to continue to work at, certainly at, at my level within Brookings. And if I return to the government, it will be one of my full-time objectives. So Cal, with that, uh, just make this as contextual opening remarks. I think we can go to Q&A if you like. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. General, first, I really want to thank you for coming out to UCLA and sitting down with us and my pleasure. discussing all of this with us. Um, I want to start with the recent events in Belgium. So you mentioned the distant provinces, you mentioned Belgium. Do you see these activities outside of the core as a sign of growing strength or growing weakness? It's really both. Uh, in the context of the appearance of the uh, growing capacity of the caliphate, it's important for uh, the caliph and his leadership to depict to those who would be supportive of this movement uh, that the organization is both inevitable because of the doctrine that it follows and the prophecy of the end of times, that it is inevitable and it is also invincible. Uh, because, it, in fact, it is losing on the ground in Iraq and Syria, uh, and that th there is just no narrative that they can use to explain the fact that they are not, in fact, winning, uh, it's been very important for them to leverage the overseas provinces and in particular, the network uh, to do two things, to improve recruiting, to try to get more foreign fighters to the place where they can be of most value, 
But we've been warning about this for some time, and that is there would come the day uh, when we would see the organization undertake terrorist activities in the heartland of the coalition to sow terror in the population of the coalition, to try to disrupt the cohesion of the coalition, and that's what you're seeing now. And my belief is that as we continue to increase the pressure against core ISIL uh, on the ground in Iraq and Syria, we're going to see even more of these uh, because they're approaching a desperate moment, frankly. Let me ask you about the region generally because I know you've spent a lot of time there. Uh, I was recently at a dinner, I think Chancellor Karnasal may have been there as well, where a, a senior a former senior uh, Obama administration official mentioned that, or noted, that we had intervened and occupied in Iraq, and the result was chaos, that we had intervened but not occupied uh, in Libya, and the result was chaos, and we had neither intervened nor occupied in Syria, and the result was chaos. And one implication was that the chaos is inevitable in this part of the world right now. Uh, and as a result, we might uh, be wise to, uh, I don't want to say withdraw, but to, to, to seek a smaller footprint, to be less involved. Um, do you think there's any merit to that view? Do you have any comments about that analysis? Uh, you know, again, uh, your uh, first question is very important. This one's very important as well because it sort of sets the conditions uh, or the strategic trajectory for how the United States would view the region. First of all, the chaos is heartbreaking for me. Uh, I've lived amongst the Arabs uh, on a number of occasions. I lived, I was fundamental ultimately in recruiting the tribes to turn against Al-Qaeda in 07 and 08. Uh, I have great respect for them and I have great respect for the faith of Islam. Uh, was deeply involved in the Middle East peace process with, the, with Israel twice, so I, I have great concern that this uh, ally of the United States is surrounded on, on all sides now with either in unstable states or states that uh, pose a direct threat to Israel. Um, but we're really seeing, I think, uh, the, the fraying of the institutions of government uh, across the region that, uh, that never really had the capacity to govern in the way or the manner that the, the people within those states uh, deserved. Uh, weak institutions, endemic corruption, uh, the value of of uh, oil uh, and the, the, the enormous wealth that came from the oil uh, didn't create permanence and didn't create resilience. It created uh, opportunity and it created privilege. So there are really substantial numbers of people in that region who've been largely uh, completely disenfranchised. And when they rose up during the Arab Spring, uh, what we found were charismatic uh, dictators in many cases <clears throat> or charismatic leadership that ultimately had to either compromise what they were doing or collapse uh, in the aftermath of widespread civil unrest, the government that compromised didn't really have the governmental capacity to adjust to the needs that the, the social masses were bringing as the problems and when the collapse occurred there was basically no alternative. And we're seeing this because, I think, of inherent weakness in the systems of government across the region. Uh, and as, I, my, as my comments uh, sought to convey, uh, we, we have got to take the deep view here. We simply cannot be satisfied with dealing with one non-state actor after another, which not only uh, creates a security, an, an immediate and direct security problem for the United States and our allies and our precious friends in the region, but also preclude the kinds of movement towards long-term stability that we want in the region. So it's not just a security issue. It's an issue that precludes the ability for us to create that widespread stability. We, so we have to start to think deep. And, and the way I try to depict it is we have three horizons. The near horizon is the one that we're faced with today, which is widespread civil war, social unrest, uh, the emergence of non-state actors, very capable extremist organizations, the acceleration of technology, which has given social media the capacity uh, to level and network unrest in, in a very widespread and very uh, uh, accelerated manner. We, we have to deal with that in the short term, but we can't just deal with that. We have to start to think at a, at a more distant horizon. A distant horizon is to strengthen those states that are still relatively stable, but still fragile, 
and to work with them not on just military or security measures. In fact, I would contend that the preponderance of the changes that are necessary are in governance, economic capacity, and judicial capacity. Because if people have no hope of an economic future, if they have no hope of justice, and justice is really important to people, whether it's justice as we know it or Sharia justice, if there's no hope of justice, sure. then they will move to the doctrine that will give them justice, which is generally a radicalized doctrine. Um, education, health care, women's rights, human rights. And we can work within those societies at a distant horizon to give them the capacity and the resilience that as we can give them some security capacity, they can be resistant to these forces that increase fragility and enhance collapsed states. But then we have to have the deep look. And this is a generational look. It's, it's working with as many of our partners in the region to try to undertake the kinds of reforms necessary that can bring long-term stability. And I know it's e much easier to say than to do, um, but you know, we, we had a deep doctrine once before in the United States. It was called the Cold War, and Bernard Brody was you know, one of the great uh, students of it and uh, mentors uh, for it. Um, and it, it was a strategy which talked about the containment of the Soviet Union in a military sense. But in a very real sense, it was about building political capacity and economic capacity in those states so that the, the people benefited within that community. But it was also a long-term strategy. Democratic administrations and Republican administrations came and went, but they supported that strategy over time, and the result is clear. Until we're able to develop that kind of a, a deep strategy to, to build resilience and capability into our partners, I'm afraid we're going to be suffering uh, these problems for a long time. So we can't leave. We've got to stay engaged, and we've got to make a difference in this regard. You mentioned a lot of things that relate to their social issues, but there are also questions of, of governance and, and poor governance in mm -hmm. many cases. Um, as we sit here, uh, we're at almost 100 years exactly to the negotiation of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, right. which uh, the French and the British used to basically draw the lines of the Middle East as we now know. Right. Uh, and some argue, and I think there's uh, reason to believe, that a lot of the governance problems flow from the fact that these states, as we know them, don't really right. represent societies. Uh, so given all of that, uh, is it either the time to rethink those borders, or maybe is it inevitable that they will be redrawn? Yeah, I, that's, uh, again, <laughs> another really important question. You know, we used to say that uh, the heaviest fire I've taken in the Middle East tended to emanate from lines drawn on the map by a British diplomat. Uh, I, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty confident in this assessment, that if we had left to the people of the region organizing themselves in the aftermath of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, they would never have organized themselves the way they have been organized by the West. <clears throat> so what, of course, happened, as the French uh, and the British uh, divided the, the, uh, the residue of the Ottoman Empire, it froze in place uh, lines and relationships that were unnatural to the people of the region. Uh, and then uh, the emergence of the governance in that region generally wasn't well supported by the colonial masters. Uh, so we, we ended up in a situation where we had unnatural uh, groupings, political groupings, and an absence of political capacity almost from the beginning. And so as time went on, uh, and as that capacity began to truly fray and was truly revealed uh, by this massive uh, distinction between the ruling elite and, and all others within society, uh, it was clear that this, this system of organization uh, just wasn't going to work. Now, you ask a really important question because uh, when we were, we were talking in the White House uh, about how we were going to deal with ISIL, uh, you'll recall that part of ISIL's initial uh, dogma uh, was it intended to erase all vestiges of Sykes-Picot. They actually were bulldozing the border between Iraq and Syria. Uh, and the we actually raised the question, is now the time, uh, as we seek to defeat Daesh, uh, to begin to put in place or to consider putting in place in the aftermath uh, a new system of organization that more naturally meets the needs of the people. It, it's, a, it's the right question to ask, and the answer probably won't make anyone happy, 
uh, but it was really a two-part answer. And the one was, look, the, the systems of governance that we need to restore in the short term uh, are organized along the grounds of the Sykes-Picot. Let's restore those in the short term, but let's not be in the least unwilling to help to facilitate the conversation about what then comes next. For example, Kurdish independence or more sovereignty uh, uh, from Baghdad for the Sunni province, provinces in the West. And Syria, what's Syria going to look like? I don't think anybody has an, an idea of what Syria will ultimately look like. Probably an Alawi state in the West, perhaps some Kurdish uh, organization in the North. And, I, and I, I've spent a lot of time with the Turks. I know they're deeply concerned about that. That's not something we support. We've made it clear that the United States would not support a, a Kurdish uh, rump state. And then something farther in the East. Uh, but we do know that these... Uh, artificialities created some of the instability which has played itself out today. The question then becomes is can we then move to an alternative formulation that truly will meet the needs of the people? I don't think we can do that and be in conflict at the same time. We've got to solve the conflict and then have that move as the next step. I want to ask one final question and then I'm going to open it up. I know you spent a significant amount of time in recent years on the Arab-Israeli conflict. I did. So I want to ask you a little bit about that. So for a long time, it was viewed as the central issue in the region. If it could be solved, it was believed. Other things, other positive things would flow from that. Today, in light of everything we've been talking about, uh, it actually seems peripheral, not central. Uh, and it seems to have been, in fact, one of the quieter parts, comparatively, uh, of the region. So um, given all that, do you see um, links important links between solving that problem, solving that conflict, and solving some of the broader issues in the region that you've already discussed, ISIS, Syria, et cetera. Um, uh, and please comment on anything you'd like about no, that I, conflict, because look, I know there's so many elements to the, it. The other thing we're facing in the region is uh, interminably frozen conflicts. And the more of those that we can resolve in some form or another, the less pressure there is across the region in those ways. Now, I've been doing this for a while, and I can remember 10 years ago when I would walk into a relatively senior uh, Arab uh, dignitary's office. Uh, and you know, when, when you go in for these meetings, you have talking points, that you want to work your way through the talking points. And uh, I can't remember ever walking out of the office where solving the uh, Arab or the Israeli-Palestinian crisis wasn't the first or the second talking point. And it was generally, you Americans aren't doing enough on our behalf to solve this problem on behalf of the Palestinians. Um, but in the last several years, and in particular during the time that I was the president's uh, special envoy, I traveled to 30 of the 66 states, multiple times to many of them. I was in the Arab League frequently uh, in Cairo, uh, in the EU frequently as well. Uh, and Israel and Palestine just didn't come up. It didn't come up. Uh, and it's not because for them it's not important, but with the region aflame, with collapsing and collapsed states all around, uh, with uh, extremist organizations, you know, tugging at the, the, the very uh, pillars of societal uh, strength in many of these states, um, I don't think it's less important to them, but I think there are other things that are so much more immediate and so much more urgent uh, that uh, you know, their willingness to even talk about it is, uh, is reduced. Now, at, at a personal level, um, to me, we should never stop working on this. Uh, it's about the security of Israel, the long-term security of Israel, the long-term strategic viability of the Jewish state, but at the same time, it's about uh, uh, the Palestinians in the two-state context uh, having a sovereign state that can function as an ally to Israel and not a potential failed state or a hostile state. I think that we should always be willing to do this. We should always be committed to doing this. And the last conversation I had with Secretary Kerry as I was leaving the government, it wasn't about ISIL, it wasn't about the coalition, and it wasn't about the Russian intervention in Syria. And it, it, his last question to me, because we'd worked so closely on this, was if 
an opportunity to uh, reinvigorate the Middle East peace process were to uh, present itself, would you be willing to help? And I told him what I believe in my heart, which is that no matter what I'm doing, no matter how much I'm making, no matter how old I am, for the rest of my life, I'll come off the bench to be a factor in the security of Israel. And that's important. It's, it, it's important to the United States because of who we are. It's important to the United States and Israel because of the partnership that we have, which is in so many ways special, beyond description, spiritual in many ways. Uh, but a strong and stable Israel is good for the region. It's really good for the region. And when I talk to my Arab friends out there, they talk about Israel being a force for stability in the region. And when everything else is chaos, uh, they, they do have this sense that Israel brings a sense of, of stability. But also having lived with the Arabs, living with the tribes in some horrible circumstances in uh, the Euphrates, I have great respect for the Arabs and the faith of Islam. Uh, and I've come to know the Palestinians very well. And even though there's very little trust between the two sides, and even though we tried hard and we could not uh, bring the sides together for a whole variety of, of difficult things, difficult issues, uh, to me it is always worth trying um, because what, we, what we've got to provide uh, is the Palestinians with hope that they will someday have a sovereign state that can live in peace and security with, an is, with the Israeli state, the, the Jewish state, that is secure in and of itself and both with strong alliances and friendships with the United States. Uh, and that, I think, is an obligation of all of us, frankly. So I'll stop there. Great.